um, we'll start. So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Maloney, I'm partner at Menzies and head of our hospitality and leisure sector. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our um, hospitality and leisure webinar this morning in which our internal panel of experts will provide you with their key considerations for 2022, um, which has obviously been massively affected um, by lockdown um, with the further restrictions over the Christmas and New Year period has really not helped matters, a period in which really should have aided your cash flow going into the new year. But hey, look, and at last, you know, with the, the restrictions uh, relax, relaxing, trading does appear to be getting back to normal levels. So hopefully that will continue. And just let's hope the sector will really flourish in 2022. There seems to be plenty of cash to be spent. People are looking at experiences. So keeping our fingers crossed for a really good 2022. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce our internal um, panel this morning. Um, first of all, Jordan Graves. Jordan is one of our managers who we recruited from industry um, into um, one of our offices. Um, Karen Gibb. Karen Gibb is a HR specialist who's worked for Menzies for a number of years, who, like Jordan, we recruited from industry. Um, Karen spent, spent 20 years in the um, airport environment in Heathrow um, and is part of our people um, solutions team. Um, and finally, Simon Armstrong. Simon Armstrong is a key member of our sector team. Um, he runs the outsourcing team in London, advising on bookkeeping, management accounts, and how to implement uh, new systems into your business. So um, we'll hear from them in due course. So I'm going to start with Jordan. Um, Jordan was very much at the coalface um, within the, the sector during COVID times. So he's going to um, kind of give you some ideas on, on cost savings going forward. Some you've probably already considered, um, but um, Jordan, I'll hand over to you. So yeah, I just wanted to look at kind of the, the cost base for a lot of people in hospitality and leisure sector at the minute is a, is a real struggle and it's something that is only going to get worse if we don't look at it immediately in 2022. Uh, so a recent study actually showed that cost inflation uh, up to September 2021 was running at 13 to 15% within the sector. Uh, so it's easy as an operator to go down the rabbit hole of looking at every individual cost, uh, however small it is. But I think there are a few key areas that you can really gain the most benefit from looking at. Um, I'm not going to go into VAT and things like that because VAT, even though it's huge, if the level that it's currently at gets extended a little bit further than it's expected to until March, it's not something that's particularly in anyone's control. Uh, so we, I just want to look at costs that are somewhat in operator's control. And the first one on that is uh, business rates. So the hospitality and leisure sector actually pays a disproportionate amount of business rates. So it's responsible for 3%, 3 to 5% of UK GDP, depending on the year, but pays about 13% of the UK uh, bills tax, uh, sorry, business rates tax. So I think it's particularly important in a minute to consider consider looking at business rates where the holidays are all coming to an end and it's going to start to affect everyone's cash flow. Uh, and in my experience, I, I, I ran some independent bars and hotels, uh, sorry, not hotels, bars and restaurants in South London for a couple of years. And we had one property that uh, serviced three businesses. So my experience was splitting those three businesses out into separate business units for business rates. And the effect of that was that we, the first effect was that we managed to get below the grant thresholds, uh, which hopefully aren't gonna be so important moving forward, but have been in the past. So managed to get some cash from those. And the second was that we got a big cash refund dated back to 2017 when the last uh, valuation had been done. So I think it's it's really important to look at this now. Uh, 
because if you get a good expert on board, I think valuations have been frozen for another year. The government have frozen them for another year, but I expect that they are going to uh, do another valuation in the next maybe year or two. So once you've had a new valuation done, you can't get your refund dated back any further than that valuation has been done. So. Jordan, just just a, a question for you. And, and and by the way, if if anyone has got a question out there, please do feel to uh, free, free to put it into the chat, and we'll address it during, during the webinar or, or at the end. But but Jordan, with the um, the valuation, how how easy for, for those who don't know, how easy is it to get to get the valuation? How and how do you kind of go about? Um, you know, where would you go to? Yeah, so there's no central listing of kind of reputable agents to look at, but I would definitely look into finding an agent to help you with it because it is quite a complex process. Uh, and the valuations office are quite quick to, if you do it on your own, they're very quick to kind of shut you down and say, no, it's not gonna happen. Um, I actually used a company called Altus Group who did a lot of the, the work for me and the pushing back on the valuations office, came out to see us, uh, just walked around, saw, the space or how we were using the space and then took it from there um, and they managed to get us a good uh, rates rebate what i would say is that other there are other really reputable companies out there like savills uh, who also offer these sort of services um, but the one thing i'd definitely be wary of is people approaching you because if people are approaching you it's often a scam with the business rates so make sure you're going to them if you have, if you want to try and reduce your business rates valuation. Okay, and and how do these places charge up, Jordan? Uh, so my scheme was with Altus Group was on a no win no fee, which is really helpful, especially at the minute because people just cannot afford with the cash flow at the minute to be paying fees ahead of getting any benefit. Uh, so we've only paid an invoice late after after we got the big cash refund. Uh, so I'd say definitely that's something to look at as well. Make sure that the fee structure works for you because at the minute, as everyone knows, cash flow is, is a problem. Okay, and, how far, and I think you did mention it actually, Jordan, but how, how far can you go back when it comes to um, your, your rates revaluation and, and how far can you go back for your refund? Yeah, so my, the research I've done suggests that you can only go back as far as the, the latest valuation so a lot of people will have had a valuation done in 2017 so if you have if you put the work in now to kind of try and reduce that valuation you're looking at a refund of about five years worth of uh, worth of rates i know that we had covid in the middle so you probably didn't pay rates for a year or two in that um but if you then wait until the next valuation, say, say it happens in 2023, you're only going to be able to argue that 2023 valuation, at which point you won't have paid any any rates anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really timely to look at this now because you're going to maximise the benefit that you can get in terms of cash cash refund. Brilliant. Uh, other than that, I think that was everything I wanted to talk about on business rates. I would say that they are looking, the government are looking to uh, kind of review the system for business rates because they recognise that it is unfair and it's especially unfair on hospitality and leisure who have been most affected by COVID. Uh, but at the minute, they're kind of kicking the can down on the road on that. The, there is improvements relief at the minute. So if you, I think Rishi and I uh, agreed it in the autumn budget, if you make improvements to your property, you can get a one year delay on the uplifting valuation, but you've got a cash outlay there and you're only delaying it for a year. Um, if you make green improvements to the property, then it's a longer term benefit. But again, in the short term, you're going to have to pay for that from cash flow. Um, so I'm not going to go into that too much at this point. Um, moving on, so light and heat. So gas costs and electricity costs are a big, big problem at the minute uh, in terms of cost inflation. I, I think everyone's seen it residentially, but it's also uh, commercially. And when you're working in h &L, as everyone knows, you're using a lot of gas, especially if you're a restaurant. Uh, so it's 
it can it could add costs significantly if you don't look at it immediately uh, it's yet to be seen whether it's a short or a long-term problem it could come back down we hope it comes back down it, it depends on so many factors that i can't really get into whether it is going to come down but for delivery contract prices uh, for both gas and electricity were about 150 percent higher in november 2021 than in february 2021 which kind of shows you how big an impact uh, the, the supply problem is having uh, there's no way of telling what will happen but it's important that everyone looks at their contracts now to review whether you are in a fixed contract uh, if you are in a fixed contract try and understand how long, how much longer you've got left on that fixed contract because then you can forecast what the impact is going to be when you come out of that contract if you're not in a fixed contract look at getting into a fixed contract immediately because variable rates are shooting through the roof uh, and if you can fix into a contract at least you know what you're going to be paying uh, and I, I would say probably look to brokers and look at various brokers on the gas and electricity contracts just to try and understand even if you are still in a contract for say another year uh, speaking to a broker and understanding what the rate you're likely to be moving on to in a year uh, is really important because then you can kind of forecast exactly what that's going to cost you in, a, in actual terms uh, and the last thing to note on that is if you are renewing then uh, they're going to offer you different lengths of contracts so you've got to weigh up the benefit of having a longer contract at a higher rate where you've got you know what your cost is going to be and it's fixed uh, against a shorter contract at a lower rate and i think that that's probably something for individual operators to consider in terms of how your cash flow is looking and yeah so it comes down to again with the massive thing within the sector during covid times and also going forward as well is just to you know forecasting is hugely important isn't it just to know what you have and how much you kind of can, can invest absolutely yeah uh, so moving on so we've got uh, staff costs everyone knows that there's going to be uh, a min minimum wage rise from april and even even before that we've seen that staff costs in the industry in 2021 even were were spiking massively because there's a, a squeeze on the supply of labor not just because of uh, brexit with a lot of europeans heading back to europe but also because of covid because suddenly hospitality is maybe not quite as an attractive industry to get into because people are worried about whether they're going to be able to get work if the business closes down uh, for a lockdown or anything like that uh so a lot of a lot of operators are finding that they're being forced into bidding wars uh, for staff which is just resulting in staff wages moving up and up and up uh and as a result wage bills were up in 2021 about around 13 percent from the start of the year for for the sector uh, for those still on the minimum wage where it is moving up uh the pay is set to rise 6.6 percent for over 23s and 9.8 percent for 21 to 22 year olds from april uh, the fact that wages already tend to make up about 20 to 25 percent of h l costs compared to revenues shows how significant that 9.8 percent and 6.6 percent is going to be i'd expect that employers wage costs are going to rise around seven percent compared to what they are at the minute so I think the steps that you need to take in terms of uh, staff costs are to forecast exactly if you know that you've got a lot of staff on national minimum wage then you need to forecast exactly what that is going to do to your net profit at current staffing levels. Uh, if you can then look to reduce staffing levels uh, whether that's through integration of new technologies or something like that. Um, if yeah, on that, yeah, on that, Simon, um, on that, Jordan, sorry, Simon, we'll, we'll touch on it later on, but obviously there's a bit of a trade-off here, isn't there, regarding, you know, replacing staff with, with technology. Obviously, you know, the tech is great, but, you know, the customer experience is, is massive um, in the industry more than any other kind of industry, I would suggest. So there, there is a trade-off there, isn't there? Absolutely, yeah. Quality of service, I think, is... Uh is still the key the key factor and i would say if you can't reduce staffing levels because you are worried about quality of service uh then you, the 
last thing you can do is really look at your menu prices and you have to pass those costs on to your customers through increasing your, your selling prices. Uh, so lastly, I wanted to just touch on very briefly rent. So a lot of people are finding that they aren't using the same amount of space that they used to. Uh, if that's the case, is it? The question is whether that is long term. Uh, if it is long term, you can look to uh, look to move to a smaller premises, which will obviously reduce your rent costs. Uh, and finally, you can seek rent credits and deferments from your landlord. I think. Where we're unlikely, well, fingers crossed, we're unlikely to go into another lockdown. Landlords are likely to not be as sympathetic as they have been in the past on that, um, but it's still worth it if you if you are really squeezed on your cash flow. Uh, it's still worth asking the question from landlords, uh, and that's I mean that's just a quick whistle top store of the big areas cost areas to look at, Chris. Great, thank thank you, Jordan. Um, that that that's really um insight, insightful. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> look, as I said at the beginning, um, you know there is a, a glimmer of light at the end of uh, the tunnel for your sector. There's no doubt about that at all. However, one of the key challenges at the moment that's been very well pub publicised is is the is how to attract and retain talent within your sector. Um, not only because of COVID and, and kind of the confidence level of wanting to work within the sector because of what we've gone through for the last two years, but coupled with that, Brexit has really hit the sector hard too. So there really has been a, a, a perfect storm, I, I suggest, regarding um, a talent in recruitment within within the industry. Now, Karen, um, I'm, I'm hoping you're going to um, give us a magic formula uh, this morning on how to solve this problem, because I know you're great. Um, so, um, well, Karen, there you go, over to you. What, what yeah, would you suggest? Absolutely. I've got the magic formula, if, if <laughs> only, if only. Um, I certainly will try to give some insights. Um, I think First of all, to pick up what Jordan has said about your sector, um, I absolutely agree that we, we are seeing a lot of um, comment about rising wage costs. Uh, two particular things there that I thought was very interesting, a lot of a lot in the papers this weekend about it. Um, we know the national insurance or um, the, the um, social care levy um, will go ahead. Uh, we also know the national minimum wage increase um, will go ahead. The interesting thing is the comment there is that if you take a 6.6% rise to national minimum wage and you add in inflation and the uh, increases to national insurance, your employees may really feel that that hasn't given them anything else except uh, the ability to just about keep up with the cost of living. So for you, the national minimum wage is a hefty hike. Uh, for where they're looking, um, they're only just balancing their outgoings, probably, when you add in some of you know, the things we're all worried about, like fuel costs and things like that. So um, I am going to talk about wage rates, um, but I'd only say you know, that's, that's part of the issue. Uh, you can't just go chasing new talent by hiking your wage rate for people coming in, because you then compress your wage rates internally. So, you know, we're not just talking about wage increases for new hires here. We're talking about maintaining balance across your business. Um, it, it's absolutely no point attracting new talent if what you then say to your longer serving employee, employees is, I don't value you as much because I've now compressed the gap between you and people who've just walked in. So very challenging issue, I think, around wage rates. But a, a step back very briefly, the recruitment market, no doubt, is very buoyant surprisingly buoyant and very tough um, so candidates are ready and willing to move it's quite hard to pin them down they are very savvy they are moving very fast they are watching um, salary packages wage rates um, very closely uh, they they will move now but some of them are not returning to your sector particularly if they stepped away from it in the early days of covid and found something else now that they enjoy so difficult attracting the right people. Um, talking about attracting first before we talk about retaining. Attracting is probably best if you start by differentiating between 
roles that are very driven by the wage rate. So we're talking those who are going to earn an hourly wage, probably on some kind of flexible hours with you, um, probably your really important front of house people. Uh, they will watch increasing wage rates very quickly, and it may well be what determines that they leave your business and go and join another. So that's one particular category that we're going to talk about. But you will also have those looking for the longer term career choices. They're going to look at the overall benefits package. They're going to be more worried about things that affect them in the long term around career prospects. They're going to be more discerning around the benefits that you add alongside their salary. So what are you recruiting? You know, which, which category? And that's going to determine what you need to attract them. Um, I would say that if we look firstly at the hourly paid employees, it's actually really hard to create loyalty in, in this environment sometimes. Um, so you, you really want to be clear what your benchmark is. So look at your competitors, look at the local market, look at some leading employers, be really clear what they're paying, um, be really clear where you can compete if you can. Um, and be um, make, a, make a judgment where you want to be on that wage scale. What can you afford um, and what is appropriate for you as a business? Um, so just decide what do your budgets allow? Where can you sit on that wage and salary scale? And it's a very tough choice at the moment. Not everything, though, is about the money. If you know, there was some research in the paper this weekend about what employees look for. I was quite surprised. Some of them were really simple. So some of them were about, um, you know, did they get a meal? <laughs> did they, did they, you know, how did you treat their tips? Um, did you offer flexibility around their hours? Did you show some understanding of their outside family life? So it really isn't all about the money. And your prospective employees may look at issues around parking, travel. Um, how, do, how do you deal with their tips? Do they get a uniform? Um, what is your approach and reputation as an employer in your neighbourhood? Sure. Um, so all of those things, I think, are really important. Karen, just got, got a question for you. Um, uh, zero hour contracts have often had a lot of bad press in the past. However, they can work for an employer. They can work for an employee. What's your view on, on them? And, and, and do you think... And how do you think they'll be used in the future? Yeah, good point. Some of the issues that gave zero hours contracts a bad name and, and were very poor ways to deal with employees, those things are now illegal. So essentially trapping people into your employment and not allowing them the flexibility to work elsewhere. Um, I think zero hours contracts can work extremely well, except especially in, in your sector. And for employees who want flexibility, they want the ability to turn down work as well as accept work when it suits their schedule. Um, they want that freedom of choice. They want to flex up. So they want to do additional hours when they're available. All of that works really well. And many of them combine more than one job. Now for you as an employer, great for you as well. So you can offer work when you have it and when you don't, you don't. But I do think that zero hours becomes a relatively limited choice for people at a certain stage, perhaps in their in their career and in their you know, personal life. Um, don't forget, they can turn the work down. So we do have a commitment issue here for you as well as the employer. So there will come a point when both you as the employer and they as the employee will want more commitment. Um, so it depends on the job role depends on the individual, um, also depends very much how you manage it. It's, you know, it's a complex schedule, um, but, um, you know, it, it can work very well. Okay. I think you need to move on and talk to employees when zero hours is not going to be the thing that retains them anymore. Sure. Okay, lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Heron. All right. Before I move on to the sort of other mention about salaried and, you know, more of the benefits kind of package, I'll just talk quickly about the hiring process. Just be ready for this. I'm sure you're looking already. Um, it is extremely competitive for the best people. It moves very quickly. Um, get started much earlier than you might have done in the past. Give, your, give yourself the time. 
um, and have somebody in your business who is on this all the time. So, you know, candidates are using their phones, they are applying for multiple opportunities. Um, this moves very fast and you will want somebody dedicated to it who can create a very slick process for you to get candidates in, start to engage them, start talking to them um, and essentially move them through the process quickly to be making an offer. Um, use agencies where they give you access to hard to find candidates. Um, they can work extremely well. Uh, they also can take a burden away from you. There is a cost implication, but we are talking sometimes about highly valuable roles in your business. So um, that also can be very, um, very important for you. I'd also just emphasize the in initial induction and training period. The welcome that you give to employees in those first few, few weeks is absolutely fundamental. So right from making the offer to um, bringing them in, inducting them, that initial training, really look at how well you do that. Um, I do a really critical appraisal of how well you're managing that and do it as best as you can. A quick mention then on, you've got the people, you're paying a realistic wage, how do you keep them? Um, part of this is gonna be a budgetary decision. How do you best spend the money that you've got to retain the people? I would say allow yourself some flexibility, potentially to increase the wage at the end of a training or an induction period. Build in a salary review that lets them see that you take account of increases in cost of living as much as you possibly can. Keep an eye on your competitors. You can't always chase them, but at least know what the market is doing. And perhaps think about sharing success. So the more successful you are, see how you can build that into your overall package so that the employees share the success as well and make that an ongoing process. So feed back to them on success and reward them on success. Um, and also I would say, spot your top talent, spot the people who perform well, create loyalty by giving just simple, honest feedback on great performance. Um, tell these people they are really important to you. Final comment from me um, is really that, um, you know, people do leave, they leave you because of their manager. They, they often don't leave because of the job. So um, yes, look at your wage rates. Yes, look at your benefits package. Look at what you can afford. Um, some benefits, very cost effective. They don't have to be expensive. Um, so look at that package, um, but also look at, how you manage, what, how, how um, flexible you are in your approach to shifts, how understanding you are of outside pressures on people's working environment. Um, create a level of achievement, make the work interesting, have a great team atmosphere, um, you know, recognize great performance. So you know, don't forget to be a great place to work um, as well in terms of the overall atmosphere. Karen, that's great. Thank, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> some really valuable um, tips, pardon the pun um, there, Karen. Um, uh, just, just to say to um, people joining us today, if there is any further insight, ideas or anything like that you want from a HR point of view, please feel free to, to get in touch and, and Carol, um, Karen will come back to you with some ideas. So um, please feel free to do that. So great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so um coming on to you simon I, I touched on it earlier on actually um there is a big trade-off here isn't there about um increasing uh technology within within the business in particular uh the the hospitality and leisure sector and also custom service you know um there, there's a person i speak to who's a kind of professor within this industry and, and he was talking about the importance of strong customer service know your customer know your customer's name it, it, it's huge so you, you've got that but also you've got the certain cost savings of, of technology um so simon just wondered you know to, to hear your thoughts about that kind of trade-off please um, yeah, it's a very difficult balancing act to, um, between sort of that customer service and the efficiencies that technology can bring. Um, you know, in regards to the, these technology advancements that can save on staffing costs and staffing requirements, what we're really talking about is um, self-service kiosks, 
ordering for a mobile app or at table ordering for a tablet or something similar. You know, this technology was available and in use pre-COVID. I think the pandemic's accelerated that and how wide it's used and how, how much it's used. Um, you know, it's not a quick fix. If you're looking at using this sort of technology, it needs to, to fit your market position. Um, you know, it requires significant investment. You know, there's a lot of cash up front. So it really needs to, to, to work with your target market. Um, obviously, the key benefit is that you know, the staff you have got can handle more covers at any one time, and that can sustain your staffing costs. So you know, those one benefits will, will roll on and on. Um, and it's the sort of technology that fits best with the quick service restaurant market, that sort of portion of the market. Um, but it's gonna be interesting to see how, how that expands and how, how other, other, other subsectors start to use it. Um, but yeah, it needs to be part of a long-term strategy. You need, you need to understand how, that, how that's gonna affect your market and your customer service. Um, Presumably it's going to affect your recruitment as well, because there's no good having sophisticated um, technology with your business. If it goes wrong, you've got no one to fix it. So I think, you know, it's going to move the kind of slant on what type of what type of employee you're going to need. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you need to have some, some tech, navi tech savvy servers and, and staff. You need to have a, a, a wider IT team, some maintenance teams to support all that tech. So. Yeah, although it might save you uh, some weight staff, there's still going to be other costs, costs involved that you need to need to bring into consideration. Um, like like we said, the, the trade off, the, the downside can be that you're losing the opportunity for your for your staff to have face to face interactions and deliver really good quality um, customer service. You know, you're you're losing the chance for people to demonstrate your brand values and to interact with customers and really give them you know a real top level uh, service. So it's it's a tricky one um and even if you do deploy the technology you still have to support uh your staff and develop and train them in the right way because like i say when the tech goes wrong you still fall back on the traditional okay. so you know that 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 doesn't go away i think that this is still as important <clears throat> great okay thanks simon um <clears throat> now sort of coming on to the uh continuing talking about software um <clears throat> i think as a as accountants um we often get um the information provided to us for the accounts for the audit kind of quite late on in a day and i think where you've got uh, a, a sector that's had so much turmoil over the last two years the need to have um, reliable, accurate, timely information is, is, is key. Um, so, so Simon, just wondered, you know, again, your thoughts on that and any kind of ideas you have about um, software to um, bring into your business, um, how you go about implementation, because I know lots of businesses are very forward thinking. They would have sourced this pre-COVID. During COVID, it's kind of accelerated some businesses' thoughts in getting it done. But I know there's plenty of businesses well behind, um, well behind the game at the moment. So I'm really keen to hear your your, your thoughts on this. Um, I think, yeah, you know, management information is just absolutely vital in, in running a business and making good decisions. Um, you know, I spend a lot of my time day to day supporting businesses with their systems. Um, integrations and producing management information and that word integrations that that is the key part of it that is that is what's so important um, integrations between software products it can it reduces inefficiencies reduces sort of late the labor in, in terms of human data entry it reduces human error it just allows that information to flow um, and software that that does transfer data together which allows you to, to obtain quality management information which gives time, time insights into what your business is doing, um, what's making making your margins, uh, what's what's happening, what's what, you know, what is what's working, and what's not. Essentially, you know, it's, it's allowing you to to be more informed. Um, you know, it help you make decisions around even small small things like tweaking a, a menu item just to improve the margin on a single dish. You know. It, it can be sort of that minute detail. It could be anything like, you know, is your new location, is that finally breaking even? It, it, it's, it can really value, really vary, but can be really valuable. Um, you know, it, it, you want to have sort of your EPOS system linked to your accounting software and a link to a, a cash flow forecasting product, you know, that, and that will give you some real time information, be able to scenario plan, 
you know, are you be able to meet your loan repayments when they kick in in, in a month's time? It's just just mapping all that out, getting your head around it, feeling comfortable, and and just making better, more informed decisions. Sure, I think you know, you know, at the end of the day, you know, a, a running a business isn't all about turnover that we all know it's all about profitability um you know where you're running a restaurant bar it's really key to know where your true profits lie mm. so um having the uh suitable software to to basically give you the key um the kpis that you need to understand you know where, where you know if you're where your profits are, making sure that you know you you focus on that, and maybe lose some of the the, the, the sort of uh, products, dishes you're, you're making losses on. So you do need to know that information. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I think a lot there's a lot of good EPOS systems out there that will give you some some good operational KPIs in terms of the front of house and what, what what's happening there. But you also need to know, you know, big picture. Um, you've got a lot of other hidden costs that that, that the EPOS system doesn't see. So you need to, you know, map that out and, and let the information flow through to a set of management accounts. Again, we, we, with you know some some different KPIs, some financial KPIs, um, and some and some forecasts to know where the business is going. Great. Okay, Simon, that's great. Thank you for that insight. Is there, and again, from a kind of a, a software point of view, do you have any kind of sort of recommendations of products out there that you like? Um, you know, not necessarily sort of um, uh, tied into the actual running of, a, of within the sector, but kind of sort of accountancy software products or anything like that. Where, where's your recommendations? Uh, as you were saying now, you need to be looking at the cloud. Um, you know, you're looking at products like QuickBooks Online and Xero. Which should integrate with um, most of the big EPOS systems out there now, um, and then again integrating that with a cash flow product, uh, this, this float, fathom, futurely, they'll all allow you to sort of scenario plan and, and map things out. So, yeah, that's the, that's the basics. I'll, I'll start with. Great. Okay. Nice one. Thank you, Simon. Um, <clears throat> From um, so, so from me now, just a, a brief few words. Is d during COVID times, um, as a as a sector, we were we were advising a lot on cash flow, um, providing forecasts for business businesses just so they can know what sort of loans they require, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But now, hopefully, we've got kind of some um, maybe some confidence going into twenty twenty two. Um, and you should kind of know where you are from a cash flow point of view now going into the, 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 this new year. But one thing that, that, that we do encounter quite often is businesses with a huge um, emotional, business owners with a huge emotional attachment to their business, especially when they've kind of started it up from scratch, is that um, they just struggle on and there is... There's just, just just kind of little little hope there um, to the point where they kind of walk away with nothing. Um, and I think sometimes it does take um, a strong business owner to say, right, hold on a second. I think it, enough is enough now and kind of pull that plug sooner rather than later, because at least by doing that, you may walk away with something rather than just holding on too long. Um, and then again, having enough, nothing to show. So that's something that really needs to be born in mind I think where we are at the moment um, and again it, it's often useful speaking to um, a third party advisor just going through your business looking at your your plans your business plans for us to carry out a very sort of brief business review um, be challenging in our questions on you and then we can give you insight and often it's quite good to, to turn a refer, refer defer to a third party on that so again if, if there's anyone out there who are, who's keen to have that type of conversation or or you know of any other business that that, that that would appreciate that again please do keep in touch and come back to us okay so um, what we'd like to do now is just open a poll um on two or th um, three or four questions i believe that we have um just so we can kind of know what what you'd like more um to know more about so um helena if you can kind of open up that poll that'd be great we'll just spend um a few moments with this <clears throat> 
And whilst um, what I'll do is whilst um, we you're, you're 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 doing the poll, we did um, have a number of questions that um, we got posed um, before today. Now the first question um, was: Does the panel expect further variant COVID, um, COVID variants to disrupt the um, sector in 2022? Or do they expect a strong bounce back regardless of COVID? I think, I think with that um, question, I think it all depends really on the, the type of variant. I think with um, the Omicron version, it seemed to be, it seemed to spread very quickly, but be less, dis you know, less disruptive and than, than, than other variants. So and I think the timing of Omicron wasn't great just before the Christmas and New Year period. People were very concerned about passing it on to family members. Um, so it just kind of came at the, the wrong time. So do we see uh, it disrupting the sector? Again, it depends, I would say. But as long as it's not so um, you know, destructive um, is the word, um, I do see a massive bounce back in the sector. As I mentioned at the outset, there is plenty of cash around. People are keen, I think, to go out and, and have experiences. So um, I do see it being, you know, I, I do see it being very um, positive going into 2022. Um, <clears throat> another question we got asked, um, if disruption is expected, what kind of government support, if any, do the panel expect to see? Um, just by way of reminder, I'm sure you're aware, there is this reduced VAT rate to 12.5% that um, runs until the end of March 22. Um, and also there are various uh, um, business rates uh, reductions. Um, the 66% relief comes to an end at the end of March 22. And then you've got the further 50% um, relief that runs up to the end of uh, March 23. Um, and there's thresholds regarding that. So they are two reliefs out there at the moment. Now, I wouldn't expect the government to look at um, measures uh, to help cover business costs. However, I would suggest they would uh, be keen on people spending, spending more money within the sector. So I would like to think a permanent reduction in the VAT rate uh, would be a, a favoured option, I have to say. I think the UK is, is, the, is the only country actually in Europe that doesn't have a permanent reduction in VAT in the hospitality sector. So I, I would really um, be keen on, you know, everyone tuning in today to actually write to their local MP um, for a permanent reduction in the VAT rate to 12.5% within hospitality. Um, because I think it's needed, even if it runs to the end of 2022, it will encourage um, spending um, and I think it would be good for the sector. Um, another question we, we got asked is, does the panel expect working from home to stay um, and the changing working habits? Obviously, it's a massive question. Um, from, a, from a Menzies point of view, um, we are we, we we encourage hybrid working um at the moment you know everyone knows the rules what they should be doing what they shouldn't be doing therefore we we just keep it reasonably fluid at the moment um going forward i i do see hybrids being the new norm um what you have to bear in mind though is where you have experienced staff um, I think working from home works quite well, but where you have trainees, um, where they very much benefit from working as a team, that's something where I don't think hybrid working particularly works well. Obviously, within your sector, you know, working from home is just not, obviously not possible and, and, unless there's back offices and things like that. But I do think it is here to stay. Um, you're seeing plenty of examples here of where um, businesses are reducing their, 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 their office space. Um, so yeah, my, my feeling here is yes, it is here to stay. But again, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this year goes. 
Jordan, probably one for you on this one. Um, one of the questions we got asked, is London going to experience a different type of recovery to the rest of the UK, slower or faster? So with your comments on costs, Jordan, be interested to hear your views on that. Yeah, I mean, with London, I think we have to qualify everything that I'm about to say with London absolutely got hit the worst out of everywhere in the country when it when it came to COVID, uh, just because it relies on having huge footfall and that footfall just disappeared overnight because tourists weren't coming in. Uh, people are reluctant to get on the tubes and there's just general concern about being in compact spaces with a lot of people. So London has definitely been been hit the worst. Um, but in terms of in terms of recovery, then I'd almost expect it to bounce back the most because it's got the most space to go. Um, the research actually shows that recovery so far has been slower in London than the rest of the country. But I think as confidence continues to grow uh, around, it's, I think we are at the point now in COVID where things is going to become endemic. Uh, and I don't see many more measures being taken by the government, if I'm honest. Uh, and as a result, I think people's confidence will develop and London will return to, to be the powerhouse that we know it is. Uh, in terms of hotel rooms, so average daily rates for hotels were actually up 20% in non-London regions compared to pre-pandemic. So we can see that there has been a shift so far to disperse the money outside of London. Uh, but as I say, I do expect that it will eventually move back inwards. And that's because uh, there's actually, like I said, there's more room to grow in London. So occupancy at hotels in London was six, around 60% last year on average. And that compares to around 80% for the rest of the country. So it just shows you that there's that extra room in terms of hotel space um, for, for London to recover. And interestingly, a report actually came out towards the end of last year that showed that there are 140,000 hotel rooms being developed in the UK. Um, and that compares extremely favorably with the rest of Europe. So in Germany, which was the second, second leading country on that, uh, there's only 90,000 rooms being developed. So I think there will be a strong bounce that it looks like there's a lot of confidence uh in the bounce back across the hotel sector in the uk uh and london itself was shown around a 25 percent increase in rooms expected uh so it just shows it's huge there's there's more confidence in the london market than i think people would expect at this point and i think there is definitely room for london to bounce back very quickly Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Um, <clears throat> another question we got asked, um, does the panel have any suggestions for companies playing in, planning a new hotel opening in 2022? Um, I think on this one, I, I think it's important to understand what you're offering. I think there has to be kind of uh, a clear USP, um, even before, you know, COVID, um, there's lots to talk about offering experience. I think maybe mainstream may be disappearing to a degree, but it's all about offering a, a really good experience, something a bit different. Um, Karen, I'd kind of like to bring you in here, actually, because obviously where you've got a, if you're opening a, a, a new hotel, um, there's obviously staffing is, is, is key here. And just wonder what your thoughts were going to 2022 regarding that. Um, yeah, thanks, Chris. I think um, we mentioned a couple of things uh, earlier on, you know, start start early um, and be really clear what your process is going to look like um, and how you're going to find the right candidates. I think have a look at the job roles, particularly in a new environment. So have a look at what the key roles are and what you want people to be doing. Um, have a look at what the hours are that you need those people to cover what sort of flexibility can you build into that we just talked about working from home um in your sector it's you know there's going to need to be people on site but where you can look at the most efficient rostering of employees look at where you can build in flexibility to allow you to appeal to a wider candidate market 
Um, I'd also say that, you know, you mentioned USP. Um, think about taking slightly longer if you can. I, I appreciate the cost element here, but think about people coming in and um, being trained in the way that you want things done. So build in a, a, a training package as part of your recruitment. Don't necessarily expect to go out to the market and find them already trained and ready. Take somebody one step before thinking about think about tapping into a slightly less skilled market, but then you train them in the way that you want things done. Um, we're talking here about creating loyalty with your employees and also creating a longer lifespan to their employment with you. And one of the ways to do that is to create a career path, um, create a skills path that they can undertake. Um, potentially, if you can, even build it into some qualifications that, that they get to attach to their skills profile and, and that you know people do genuinely find very valuable. Um, and it gives you then um, a you know, a fantastically trained workforce who absolutely understand how you want things done. Um, I, I'd have a look at, at those things, you know, job roles, working hours, um, building in flexibility, uh, developing skills um, and retaining those skills. Great. Thank you very much, Karen. That's really good. Um, and also with, with regards in this subject here, touching on again what Simon uh, mentioned earlier on, you know, it's just making sure you have a, the systems in place, you're actually tracking your KPIs and your results. So just making that sure that's all in place before you start. But then finally, just speak to Menzies, uh, speak to um, one, of, one of us, the sector team, and then we can give you some further details and further insight on that. So I, th I think that's, I don't think we've got any more um, questions in the chat um, this morning. So um, what we'll do is regarding your um, poll questions, we will have a look at that and then we'll follow up with you accordingly. Um, but so uh, we're slightly ahead of time here, which is great. Um, so again, thank you very much all for joining um, us this morning. I hope that was interesting and there's some good insight there. If you'd like any more, any more details or just a chat with us, by all means, please do um, keep, uh, get in touch with us. But uh, again, thank you, thank you to our panel. Thank you everyone for joining us and um, have a good day. Thank you very much.